Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Culture Binge. This is the Wisecrack podcast that's your classical liberal education in the cultural zeitgeist. I'm your host, Michael Burns, joined as always by a person who recently told me this podcast isn't doing enough for their star power, <laughs> Serby. Um, Serby, how are you today? I'm okay. I'll have my agent call you. Okay. And we're joined by a special guest who is now, I think, in the elite <laughs> club of having been on all of the active Wisecrack podcasts, um, actor, comedian, host of Podcast Review Review, Riley Anspa. Riley, thanks for being here. I am honored. This Is, is this what winning like an EGOT feels like? Because that's what it feels like to me. I think so. I, you're going to start. I don't want to be weird, but like, your life changes forever after this. Um, I feel it. I feel it like on a molecular level right now. So thank you guys <laughs> yeah. for being here for the start of this journey for me. Of course. And, and for any of our listeners, you. if you just listen to this podcast and any other Wisecrack podcast, you haven't met Riley before. Uh, she's great. She does a lot of stuff. Has a great podcast called Review Review where they review reviews and do improvisation. It's very fun. Y'all check it out. It's on the HeadGum Network. And Riley also, I'll mention this, is in the first episode of a weird new show we made that came out yesterday called Hot Take. Um, it's it's contentious. It's, you know, really changing the internet. But we made a silly game show. It's on our YouTube channel. So if you listen to Riley and you think, I would like to see that person in video talk about birds mm -hmm. in a debate format, mm -hmm. that exists. That's a thing <laughs> yes. that exists. <laughs> that you could go see. And I know everyone's having that thought, so so go. <laughs> but stay here first because I'm very excited for our talk today. Great. Well, we got a lot to talk about today. We're going to talk about a, uh, a brand new university that's going to radically disrupt academic learning forever. Um, we'll talk about uh, the changing economic landscape to being a star in Hollywood mm -hmm. and some other stuff. Um, first, a couple quick things that have been in the news. I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on this. Um, so since we were last together on this podcast, um, Facebook is no more. Facebook is now Meta. Meta is Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg is Meta. Meta is the internet. The internet is the future. Um, does it, I don't know. Have you all kept up with this? Are we, are we paying attention to tech guy announcements? Serbi, I know that you are an industry insider. Has this disrupted everything? Um, it's basically revolutionized everything I've thought about the tech industry. So I'm... So not at all. But not at all. I... I... <laughs> Didn't even know that this was coming. When it happened, I had no idea. Like the worst yeah. tech worker ever. <laughs> it kind of, it reminded me of Google Glass. Oh, yeah. Google Glass oh, came yeah. out. Go Google. Yeah. And it was introduced yeah. as like, this is going to change your eyes, your brain. We are hybridizing the human with technological capacity. And then people just got made fun of in bars in San Francisco <laughs> for wearing them. And I'm like against bullying, but I did think that was funny. But I think it was at that like weird level where a technology is aesthetically corny, so it didn't catch on. And I kind of had the same response when I watched a little bit of Mark Zuckerberg's meta thing where he was in the metaverse. I just thought like this isn't I, I don't mean cool in a weird way, but like it's kind of aesthetically lame. And I feel like because mm -hmm. of that, no one's going to care. I agree. It also just felt uncomfortable. All of it felt very uncomfortable. Yes. At literally every single part. Yeah. Every single part felt Strange. The last night we were watching, uh, my, my boyfriend and our roommate and I were watching TV, and I saw my first ever ad in the wild for Meta. And oh. it, like, they had a whole commercial for the rebrand. And it was what you ever watch commercials and it's like, before it gets to the ad, it's like, we play the game of like, now what is this a commercial for? It could be perfume, mm. it could be for socks, it could be for literally anything, nothing means anything. And so it was like, the spot was like, these four cool young people in a museum and they're looking at a painting and then suddenly like, they're in the painting and then it becomes like, the painting is like puppeteered and it kind of looks like a, a, a macrame like and paper mache diorama of like a tiger and then like trees and then it, and then at the end, it just like had the kind of like, this will be fun, meta. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and that was all it was. And it just showed like Facebook, Instagram, all those like little logos being transformed into meta. And that was it. And I have no idea what they were selling me. It was gorgeous. <laughs> so it's a lifestyle. It's, an, it's a spiritual experience. Um, yeah. I, mean, I love this because one of my uh, favorite comedians who I've mentioned on the show before, Connor O'Malley, 
put out a video on his YouTube channel like six or nine months ago called Endorphin Port about an angry white man who wants to plug in and live in a digital space where there's no more bodies and it has very bad uh, graphics in it. But someone should, if, you, if you're interested in the meta thing and you think it's funny and you want to see someone who roasted it or satirizes it in a smart way, you should check out Connor O'Malley's Endorphin Port video. Um, another thing that's that's happened in the world since we we're all last together, the movie Eternals came out, which is now the lowest rated marvel movie ever according to rotten tomatoes you know asterisks it's rotten tomatoes we're not saying that that's you know uh, tablets from the mountain or anything i don't know i assume that serby did not rush out to see eternals first week am i correct correct so i used to really love those marvel movies i was a big fan when they first uh came out um and then i just hated that i there's so much investment you have to watch all of them in order to keep up with everything and I, I I don't have time for that, I've, or nor interest. Riley, I don't know you well enough to predict. If I had to bet, I would say that you have not seen Eternals in theaters. You are correct, Michael. I okay. have not seen Eternals in theaters. I um I I enjoy I can I and I like me a handful of Marvel films, but I'm not mm-hmm. a, I'm not a Marvel gal. Um, and so I there's. But Eternal, once I can stream that shit, I'll watch it. Sure, I love me some yeah. Angelina Jolie. Like, like let's well, let's go. Speaking of Angelina Jolie, the part of the movie I saw, and I, I was committed. We we I had to see it because of because of Wisecrack. We have to watch stuff sometimes. So I came back from a raucous bachelor weekend, had a few hours to drink a juice and recover at home. Went straight <laughs> to the theater to see Eternals, and all I could think about is how there's ten Eternals. Nine of the Eternals speak in the voice that the actor that plays that Eternal speaks in in life. Angelina Jolie, however, speaks in a high British accent. The entire movie, just very distracting. And I just wanted to know, was was Chloe Zhao like, okay, you nine, just talk how you talk. Angelina, let's let's have a chat. Um, oh. Or was Angelina just like, <laughs> you know, they t- started talking about dialogue and she was like, I, I got this. Don't even worry. Don't even worry. She's busting back out about. her Tomb, Ra- Tomb Raider days. Yeah. And then I mentioned this to my partner who said, wait, doesn't Angelina Jolie have one of those like Madonna like affected British accents? And I forgot. I don't often hear her speak. I did see her at Trader Joe's once, but I didn't I didn't say anything to hear her voice. And the I've one always by the liked old her. Wisecrack office? Listen, we're not much we're not trying to dox people here. <laughs> um I I do know that her accent is weird in films. I just assumed she did it for her character. But maybe she speaks like that in real life. Yeah. Well, you know, check that movie out if you want, friends. It's fun. Um, So let's get into the segment that we got some emails of people saying they still like it and still want us to do it. So I appreciate that. Slaps and Chaps, where we talk about something that slaps, i.e. that we are currently enjoying, and that chaps, i.e. chaps our ass, because we don't like it. Let's start with Serby. What are your Slaps and Chaps this time? Um, So my slap is that our wonderful listener, Ray, sent an email last week sharing some Spain tidbits. And I'm it's a good so, email. It was such a great email. It was super charming and funny and sweet. Um, and I'm very grateful for all of the information. And I've already made a list. Uh, and I I just, I kind of want to hang out with Ray in person. So maybe I'll see if that's going to happen. Uh, and then my chaps is that I'm wow. in a bit of a TV show lull. So if anyone has any recommendations, please let me know. Um, and then I also have like a bonus slap chap combo. Uh, so one of my dearest friends got married on October 30th and it was the most fun wedding I've ever been to because we all dressed up in costume. Um, oh my God. That's amazing. It was so cool. Like it was so fun to see everybody's personalities and just looking out like at the crowd and like seeing like an inflatable dinosaur and someone dressed up like a flamingo. Like that stuff was so cool. Um, and I'm really sad that the wedding is over because I've been looking oh, forward to it for wow. so long. So it, like she and I were talking about it because it was supposed to be last year, but she had postponed it. Um, so we had been talking about it forever and it slowly kept morphing into more and more of a Halloween wedding. Um, so there were like very charming touches like bats on the cake and the invitation looked very like retro, but also had like some Halloween elements. Um I just, I loved all of it, and I'm really sad it's done, and I want every wedding to be a Halloween wedding from now on. Wow. That's incredible. 
I'm going to text my wedding planner right now, all caps, make it spooky. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's amazing. Um, Riley, how about you for your inaugural oh. edition of Slaps and Chaps? Oh, my God. Okay. Already out the gate with a chat. My phone has not been charging fully. I don't know if it's my charger or what, but it's, I'll leave it plugged in overnight, and then I'll wake up, and it's like 6%. And I'm like, come on, mm. man. Especially, it's like when I have to do like self-tapes on my phone and not okay, know question. if it's going to be Do you alive. have an Apple iPhone? I do. Have you ever gone to the battery port and you use like a a pin or something and get the fuzz out of it? Okay, just making sure because that's done a thing it that's like, happened to I me before. I did it like once and the, and then it worked a little bit and then the next day I had to do it again and Damn. it's just it's been tough and I haven't had the time to just go to the Apple Store and get it figured out. So that's just been that's really been chapping my ass. Who has time for that? The, I know. the Genius Bar is very exclusive these days. It used to be a casual <laughs> neighborhood spot. And now you can't just <laughs> roll up. It used to be my local hunt. And now it's yeah. just, it's just a whole other thing. <laughs> um, but what's been... Okay. So here's a kind of a chap that turned into a slap. We... Oh my- my, my boyfriend, roommate, and I, we were so excited for Halloween, and we're like, you know, we're going to stay, and we're going to make a few drinks, watch some movies, and we're going to hand out candy to trick-or-treaters, because last year Halloween wasn't a thing, and we're like, maybe we'll get some this year. We got a whole bowl of candy. We got the good stuff, too. We got, like, the Reese's, M&M's, like, Snickers. Like, we got the, the good stuff. We got nary a one. <gasps> nary a trick or treater. It was devastating. We literally were like, what gives? We go outside, look on our street. It is dead. It's like even more oh. dead than just like a normal night because I forgot. So I'm from LA and I forgot that the culture of trick or treating in LA is like you don't just do your neighborhood. You drive to like the the neighborhoods where you know you're going to score candy or oh, whatever. I didn't know that. And Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, so that sucked and was very sad. But now we have a bunch of leftover candy and we have the little fun size bag. Like, I'm not like a huge candy person, but I love chocolate, but I'm not like candy. But we have the little fun size bag of M&M's. M&M's are so good, you guys. I often forget how hard M&M's slap. They're simple but effective. And I had like, you know, the little tiny fun size comes like maybe with 10 I pounded like four of those bad boys in a yeah, row girl. yesterday. Like they are so good. Melt in your mouth, not your hand. I'm <laughs> telling you, they're amazing. Wow, that's M and M's making people happy. I bought M and M's at a concert two weeks ago because I didn't have time for dinner before, and I was worried, that's but I didn't really eat good. them. Brought them to another concert a few days later because I thought someone might want them. One of my friends had them and it made him so happy. And I was happy that M&M's made him happy. Um, he also said the drugs he was on made them taste extra good. But that's that's, <laughs> that's I'm not really recommending good. that you don't be like him. Um, <laughs> oh, slaps and chaps. <laughs> yeah. I'll keep mine quick. My slap is the underrated early 2000s comedic work of Tom Green. I bring this up because I did have a a bachelor party over the weekend and, you know, we were going to obviously like go to strip clubs and like just like throw cocaine in the air and and have a classic wacky misogynist adventure. But instead, we ended up staying up, watching a lot of weird comedy videos on YouTube, let us down a rabbit hole, realized that Tom Green is really good, kind of underrated as an absurdist a social, physical comedian. His movie that's one of the worst reviewed things ever, Freddy Got Fingered, actually holds up in many ways. <laughs> His appearance in the the uh, road trip comedy, Road Trip, is also very funny. Just a good thing to go back. And if you're a younger uh, listener of this podcast and you like weird comedy, go back and watch clips from the original Tom Green show. It's very weird, um, but holds up very well. So I will recommend that. My chap, this is the last time, hopefully this is the last time I'll ever have this as a chap. Getting married next weekend. Next time I'm on this podcast, I no, maybe two podcasts, I'll be a, a married man. That's um, so exciting. Wedding planning is the worst thing ever. No one should get married. Oh, just it's there's, <laughs> And I'm not even that involved. Like it's, it's primarily my partner and her mom doing stuff, but it's just a lot. And I just think like no one should do it, you know, like unless you're like really much like a natural planner. If you find someone you love, go someplace, just the two of you, take care of it, throw a party later. It's it's weird to be. Take care of it. You know, just take <laughs> care of the thing. You're doing a job. Take, <laughs> yeah. So that's my that's my advice there. But, you know, Serbi got all the all this uh, Spain advice. I'm going to say I'll bring this up again later when we talk about emails. Listeners, if you're married. 
give me advice. How, how can I be good at being married? I'm, I'm bad at most things. I want to be good at being married. So I want advice later. Um, but speaking of advice, this isn't really an advice thing. My advice to you is remember to like, subscribe, and, and review this podcast. It means a, a lot to us. Um, you, you, you give it stars. Boo. You subscribe to it. You review it. When you review it, have some fun with it. We always say you can tell us what we are in a certain category of things. Um, you know, what Greek god would we be? What eternal would we be? Um, all those things. I would like to be Druid or, or Kingo if I have an option. Um, but do that. It means a lot to us. But what means a lot to me is hearing what Serbi has to say about things. And Serbi this week has some stuff to say about stars and yeah. money and Hollywood and power and the biz. So, Servi, take it away. What do you want to talk about this week? Okay, so I read an article recently in The Economist that explores how streaming has changed the economics of talent. And it comes down to this. Streaming has disrupted the TV and movie business and the way that talent is compensated. So the the power of major celebrities is fading because before there were only a handful of studios and they were all vying for the attention of celebrities. So celebrities could get whatever they wanted because there were only like five of them. But now, five of them meaning five studios. But now we have dozens of streaming services and they all have a ton of money. So the power has shifted from the celebrity to the studio or the streaming service. And there are so many shows, so many films, and the demand for entertainment professionals has increased. And you would think that this would be great news because more demand means more jobs, more people in acting. But the reality is that for the biggest actors and writers, they're losing out. And that's because of the payment model created by streamers. So in the past, during the pre-streaming era, big celebrities would get a, a small upfront fee and then a back-end deal. And the back-end deal could generate a significant amount of money because they would share in the project's future earnings. With streaming, however, the model is to pay out talent in a lump sum in the beginning, and then they have like maybe a small bonus if the project does well. And this buyout model works really well for creatives, most creatives, because you're guaranteed a ton of money regardless of a project's success. However, for big talent, like the Angelina Jolie's, they're losing out. And this is from the article from The Economist. The old contracts were like a lottery ticket. Create a hit show that ran for six or seven seasons and you might earn $100 million on the back end. If you make a phenomenon like Seinfeld, you could earn $1 billion, which is what Larry David did when he created Seinfeld. So this is a trend that will continue, and it's projected that in the United States, the number of jobs in acting, film, and editing will increase by 33% over the next 10 years, which is uh, four times America's total job growth rate. So one fantastic effect of all of this is that below the line workers, such as cameramen and sound engineers and uh, people who work in like wardrobe and things like that, They've never been busier and they have a ton of jobs available. Um, and an interesting like side effect of it is that um, I was curious if streaming services have diluted the allure of celebrities. Like has has mm -hmm. like celebrity worship um, decreased as a result of streaming services? And so I polled my younger cousins about their views on celebrities. Uh, and um <laughs> They're not interested at all in celebs. They're not phased by them at all. Um, they don't see them as being super famous. They're not really interested in their lives. They're not interested in and really anything that they're doing, except for a few exceptions for like big hits like Ted Lasso or Schitt's Creek or something like that. But other than that, they don't have this like starry eyed look when they when they like think of Angelina Jolie or I can't mm -hmm. even think of any other celebrity. But um, like Brad Pitt and stuff like that. Like they, they just don't have that. They're not like interested. Jack Black, or Jack Black, or Tom Green. Like all these people. Yeah. Who... The, <laughs> the main ones. Yeah. The main. The main. Um. So they're not interested. And one of the reasons they cited is that it's hard to tell who a celebrity is because they watch so many shows, wow. and they're That's like, "Well, wild. who's a celebrity?" Like, 
we watch just so many TV shows and like Mm -hmm. there's just so many people. So anyway, I'm very curious about what you two think and whether streaming services has sparked the end of celebrity worship culture or if you think um, it's good that celebrities are paid less uh, now. Like, is it better that the majority is paid well rather than all the power is held by a few? I'm really curious about your thoughts on all of it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to let Riley go first because everyone who listens knows I'm about to pivot to some like union uh, egalitarian model thing <laughs> where everyone crushes except executives. So, you know, skip ahead. But uh, Riley, what are your thoughts <laughs> on this? Um, yeah. I mean, my, my thoughts go to like the culture of it all because that's fascinating of like there's there's just so much content that it's like it's not, you know, the same five celebrities just doing everything. And so it's like, oh my God, you're the only person who stars in movies. (laughs) Like, I want to be like you. But in a way, you know, it's like, as content is becoming more accessible, you know, streaming at home, whatever, it's like the the being a celebrity is whatever that means is becoming more accessible. I mean, it's like, then if you take into just like, not only just film and TV, but then you have like, TikTok, Instagram, all these things that it's like literally anyone can be famous at this point, YouTube, you know, whatever. And so it it takes the allure away. Um, but then when you have something like Schitt's Creek or Ted Lasso, both of which feel and kind of are like personal stories, like from the creators. It's like, what I feel like celebrity culture has shifted to like being in awe of this like unattainable idea of a person to being like really, well, I know them. And like Jason Sudeikis' divorce is hard on all of us. And you can really see how it plays out in season two, episode one of like da 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 da. And so Mm -hmm. like it becomes like, I think, we feel like we're more in the know. So it becomes less of like unattainable and more of like, well, they're my best friend. And so it's like, I can tell by like how Jason wore that hoodie when he received that award that it's like, he's going through something. And so it, it feels, yeah. so I, it's, it's both. It's, it's really, um, it's fascinating. And I'm all here for like, not, um, putting celebrities up on pedestals. Cause I don't think it's good for anyone. It's not good for us. And it's also not good for them. Like, that's it. I could not imagine, you know, it's like that, that just sounds um, awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, be, it's interesting to, to hear the Sudeikis thing you say, because I think there's these like two sides of that coin, right? Sudeikis is really big because he like, you know, wears his tie dye hoodie and seems emotional at award shows. And we know so much about his life. Also, you know, I won't spoil it, but one of the Eternals after credit scenes had to be hard for Jason Sudeikis. Um, but. Like then I think on the other hand of someone like a Donald Glover who has also become really famous or maybe I just think he's really famous largely by making himself kind of unknowable. Yeah. Um in so yeah. many ways and like removing himself fully from the social media economy. I think he largely lives in either like Hawaii or Atlanta. Um you know, it's been 3 years since the last season of Atlanta came out. He releases music sometimes. But I feel like there's so that's so rare these days because the mm-hmm. model is put yourself everywhere to make yourself famous. Um, and I think you make a really good point too about, yeah, like TikTok, YouTube, online celebrity. It's really deflated the allure of old Hollywood celebrity, especially from young people. Like there's mm-hmm. people on the internet that a 10 year old think of as significantly more famous than like Leonardo DiCaprio or Jennifer Lawrence, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. But there, there's a cranky take that I won't give as well. But one, one could be one, <laughs> one could be cranky about that, because I do think there's also that pocket of celebrity where we like people because they're good. So like mm-hmm. I don't know, I saw um, the movie Spencer last night, and I'm not historically the biggest Kristen Stewart head, but after that movie, I was like, oh, she's really good, and now I'm excited to watch more Kristen Stewart movies because I didn't realize if you just like let our girl cook for two hours in a British accent wearing '90s fits, she just cooks. Mm-hmm. Um, Should check out yeah. the Twilight series. <laughs> yeah. No way, no way. I absolutely, I, I know it exists, and that's all. But yeah, but I mean, I think the other side of this too, though. I'm curious what y'all think about this. My utopian dream for the entertainment industry is that it becomes the number one creator of like comfortably up, upper middle class c- creative careers. And by that, I mean there's so much money in the industry. There's so much money, and historically, it was like. 
a few actors got a lot of money and then the executives got a lot of money and then some people at the production level got a little money and then the crew was kind of like decent. And we know we talked about the IOTC strike a few episodes ago on this podcast. We know it's still an issue where people that work below the line are like, hey, don't work us to death and mm-hmm. give us fair wages. There's enough money for there to be tons of content and more like specific content to people's interests where the people that make that make very fair wages. They might not make mm-hmm. $50 million on a project, but that's fine. But the bummer is it seems like what's happening is as some of these actors, writers, producers make less, it's because executives are making more. So mm-hmm. like Reed Hastings at Netflix, whoever runs Apple, all these people, they're just making shit tons of money. And my dream world would be a world where like, we just have a lot of content. Everyone's making decent money to do it. Um, and there's enough going around where like you could watch the stuff you like and your weird favorites can get something made. And then if you want to watch some uh, a Leonardo DiCaprio movie, you could do that too. And everyone works and has fun. And we also fix the climate. That's my dream. That's so beautiful. I would love that. That's the world I want to live in. Yeah. It won't happen. It won't happen, people. But but that's, I just can't help thinking about that when we talk about, you know, uh, the proliferation of scre- streaming services and alternative models of producing and consuming content because mm-hmm. people, people love this stuff. Mm-hmm. People love the content. <laughs> they can't get enough of this stuff. <laughs> Nine out of ten of Serbia's cousins will agree. Content <laughs> is great. It's a great sample. Yeah. I mean, do, do you all think, are there any, how, how in, in, in your lifetimes, what is your relationship with star power been like, you know, mm. like, has it transitioned from you've, you've lost the glossy eyed allure of some of these big celebrities? Are there people that we still from childhood think of as, you know, beyond human or something like that? I'm just kind of curious. So I uh, I love celebrity gossip, um, not because I'm like super like into celebrities. I just love the wild things that they do. Um, I've never really been really into celebrities. The only people that I used to get like starry eyed over were <clears throat> like government officials and uh, U.S. Supreme Court justices. Uh, so I'm not like, the most, I'm not a great person to talk to when it comes to stuff like this. Um, so, uh, but over time I have realized that I care less and less about really most people. Um, so even if I were to see like Chief Justice Roberts, I would not be like, holy shit, it's Chief Justice Roberts. I would just be like, okay. So... <laughs> They just, okay. Yeah. I was waiting for, when I asked about celebrity, I was like, which chief justice is going to come up? <laughs> just the one. <laughs> just the one. <laughs> what about you, Riley? Oh, it's what? Like, I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, I don't know. At least for me, like, I'm thinking about when I was younger, if I had that, I think, like, the thing I would mo- probably like, uh, the thing that's most related to, I guess, is like, I'd get starry eyed over like my crushes, like my celebrity mm-hmm. crushes. But even then, that, I don't, th- that was just like, I have a crush on this actor, or a crush on whatever. And that didn't necessarily feel like, oh, they're celebrity. Like, mm-hmm. that's why I like it. It was more just like, I think they're cute and they act good. Like, that, that was the extent of that. And so I don't think I ever, yeah, I never was like, oh my God, like, a cele- like a star. I think it's, I'm probably like at this point in my life now, um, bigger fans of people for like, I'm like, oh, I really like the stuff they're making. Or like, I think mm-hmm. like they have incredible talent or like, I really like their vision or like that seems really similar to the stuff that I like. But, but that just feeling more of like, oh, I'd like to work with them or I really admire them rather than like they're this unattainable idea of someone that's like, oh my God, stars. They're not just like us. They're different. And like, mm-hmm. that's amazing. Like I, I, which, wow. this And this kind of goes back to my Jason Sudeikis point because like, let, for example, like I love Billie Eilish. I, um, oh, yeah. God, oh my God, literally anything she does, I'll eat that shit up. I think she's fantastic. And so I watched her doc and that was so like it, it was a fantastic documentary if you haven't seen it. But it's like um, it's really humanizing and it just it's like it really personalizes her and like the shit that she went through in making her albums. And so it's like now I'm like, oh, well, like I can listen to, 
you know, when we all fall asleep, where do we go? And I'm like, well, I know where she was like emotionally making this. And so my girl, <laughs> Billy, in the same way, I think it's like, it's a really interesting shift. So you have the Donald Glover approach and then you uh, you have the, the flip side of that is like, I'm going to make myself seem like your fucking confidant, your best friend. And like, so then you're going to be more invested in what I do. Like, I don't know if that was the approach going in, but that like gets me hook, line and sinker. Like I so fall for that. I'm like, oh, well, I mean like, yeah, Billy, we go way back to her <laughs> Apple Plus doc. And so it's like, I get her. I just get her. Uh, but there's something <laughs> valuable in that too. Cause I think there's like a reframing of, people that work in entertainment as being people who who work and create things and are not like sent from the stars mm -hmm. with inherent talent that makes them magical. And there's something important about that, recognizing a lot of these people are people. And I'm not the biggest into like gossipy culture, but it, there is something interesting about these people becoming, I don't know, more human and us appreciating them as talented humans who have worked hard to get where they are and stuff like that. I would say the only stars I think I've ever feel like struck by are not people in entertainment, but athletes. And I'll say oh. that because I think that when I like basketball a lot, right? So obvious example, like LeBron James, he truly has a skill set that no one else has. It's not that there's other people who are as good or potentially as good at basketball as LeBron James out there who just like, you know, couldn't get an agent or something. Whereas I do think in, you know, actors, musicians, writers, I do think there's way more super talented people than will ever have work that's produced at a mass scale. Um, that's not to take anything away from the people who do make it, but I don't think that in entertainment, like the only good actors are the ones who are series regulars. The only good writers are the ones who are getting films produced. No way, there's tons of good people. Whereas there's something about professional sports where like, no, those literally just are the best people. And and you you can't do that. Like you, you could work as hard as you want. You can never do that. So I'm still kind of fascinated by that. Also, just because a lot of professional athletes are, are are bigger and stronger and taller than normal people. So when you see them, it's like Jesus Christ. <laughs> Whereas the yeah, actors can. are the opposite. I, you know, sometimes you see we we live in in Los Angeles, and sometimes you'll see someone and you're like, oh, that's that's what they look like. Especially the dudes. Um, <laughs> Tom Cruise dudes. is apparently super short. Yeah, all the dudes are. Most of the dudes, you're just like, really. But then some of some of the famous um, women in Hollywood I, that I've run into, I have been like, Hol "Holy shit! How how did that's a person who exists?" Um, <laughs> January Jones is not CGI. Both. Oh, January Jones is stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but we got to back away from this topic because we're we're going down some rabbit holes. Any final thoughts on this before we move on to just a really inspiring tale of rebels starting a school to tell it like it is. I just want to amend my comment earlier about January Jones. I was thinking of Christina Hendricks. Okay. January Jones, if you're listening, Serby says, <laughs> you ain't shit. You are trash, according to Serby. You look like everyone else she sees you're nothing. at Ralph's. Thinking just of the like, other one get a Mad job, Men. January Jones. Been there, just done that. I'm kidding. I would Don't want to be on record with that. Yeah. Okay. So... I talked about the movie Road Trip earlier, uh, early 2000s, I think pre 9-11 comedy, which features Tom Green in a bit role. In the movie, the main character, Josh, played by Breck and Meyer, has a girlfriend named Tiffany, and she attends a place called the University of Austin. Now, in the movie, they do not call it the University of Texas at Austin. They just call it the University of Austin. This creates hilarity when Tom Green's character accidentally tells someone it's the University of Boston. But... Inspired by Road Trip, I assume, a group <laughs> of writers, activists, and op-ed industrial complex grifters have announced that they are starting a new university called, you guessed it, the University of Austin. Um, now, this was announced um, in Barry Weiss's Substack this week, um, an announcement written by Dr. Pano Canellos. Um, very sorry, Dr. Canellos, if I said your name not completely correct. Um, and their motivation for starting this is the illiberalism and censorious, censoriousness? and seriousness prevalent in America's most prestigious universities. They use crazy words because they're really smart. Um, the basic gist is they think that universities are not free places for ideas and expression and that people get censored and canceled. So they need to start 
a new university, University of Austin or UATX. A um, couple things right now. Are they an accredited university at the moment? They are not. Do they offer courses at the moment? They do not. <laughs> um, is there a physical campus? There is not. Um, they are raising money. They're trying to raise a quarter of a billion dollars. Wait, is $250 million a quarter of a billion? Probably not. I'm dumb. They're trying to raise $250 million. Next summer, they're having what they call a soft start with something called Forbidden Courses. It is a non-credit program, and the founders say this will offer spirited discussion about the most provocative questions that often lead to censorship or self-censorship in many universities. So they're trying to create a space where you can talk about the forbidden ideas that normal colleges won't let you talk about. Does it um, say what, like what the these discussions are, like what the topics I, I, are? There is no um, on the university's website as of right now. I have it open. I, they have not, unless they've updated it. There is no list of what that is. Hmm. I could say what I imagine it would be, but I think that people. In the, in the comments will get mad at me but maybe we'll get to it um <laughs> they have some people on their board um according to the new york times they're some of the most prominent iconoclast in the country we got uh larry summers former harvard president economic advisor to barack obama got steven pinker uh, a linguist and psychologist who has opinions some of which people don't like david mamet um good playwright bad guy um, Glenn Lowry, who's an economist at Brown. Most of these people have one thing in common. I'll let you guess. <laughs> and the uh, professor who is leaving St. John's College in Annapolis, who wrote the op-ed in Barry Weiss's newsletter, said, so much is broken in America, but higher education might be the most fractured institution of all. So they're locating the university as the, the core fracture in America. He also goes on to say, our democracy is faltering in significant part because our educational system has become illiberal and is producing citizens and leaders who are incapable and unwilling to participate in the core activity of democratic governance. Um, another thing as well, on they have a frequently asked questions thing on their page. And one of the, the FAQs is why Austin and this prestigious institution that's focused <laughs> on, on intellect at all costs says, this is on their website. I'm not making this up. It says, if it's good enough for Elon Musk and Joe Rogan, it's good enough for us. Stop. Um, so that's what they think. <sighs> um, I love that that's the FAQ. Like, why yeah. Austin? Yeah. Not... Everyone's yeah. asking and why everyone's this? clamoring to know. That yeah. is a frequently asked question. And then <laughs> the top of mind question. <laughs> people <laughs> that desire an intellectual community that rigors only that of, you know, Aristotle and his students in Athens. What they're thinking is, where is Joe Rogan? Where is Elon Musk? They are, you know, on the Mount Olympus of intellect. I don't know. I think that was really silly. Only last thing I'll say we'll talk about this is, um, so Barry Weiss is one of the people behind it. I just find this very fun. So the whole point is, these people are arguing that there's no freedom for a diversity of ideas in the contemporary university. Now, people listening to this podcast know that I have a lot of problems with the contemporary university. We talked about it last time. We can get into it. But Bari Weiss, when she was in college, started a campus organization to get professors fired who had views different than her own. And for example, and this is from a piece in New York Magazine written by Sarah Jones, which is great. Um, it says, you know, Weiss and her fellow activists targeted Arab professors for speech they deemed hostile to Israel. Um, so this is someone who, when, when she was in college, worked to actively get professors canceled because they had views different from her own. That's just there. That's the thing that exists. So I don't know y'all. Um, I have way too many opinions on this. This is very new news too. We're all, this only got announced a couple of days ago. How are we all reacting to UATX? Oh, fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. And this has been so Culture Bang. You're right. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> what else is like this? <laughs> People make the money in the most interesting ways. Like, this is so ridiculous. I, I, but hasn't this happened before? Wasn't there another or was yes. this a movie? It, it has happened, right? Like a fake yeah. university like this? There, there's well, there's quite a few. I mean, so there's quite a few universities that were started by groups that wanted to have their own thing. So in um, the New York Magazine article about this that Sarah Jones wrote, she talks about Liberty University started by Jerry okay. Falwell. Um, there's a place called like 
Patrick Henry College. That's like an old school American values place. Um, there, there was a a kind was of was that the one for like homeschool, like from the homeschool board. Um, I think those are all like boys that wear boat shoes and think that the founding <laughs> fathers were good. Got it. Um, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> there's there's a the home, days. but there's a homeschool thing too, and and there's been some to be like fair here that I'm not just trying to crap on people from the right. Um, one of the biggest grifter institutions ever was this thing called the Global Center for Advanced Studies, started by some kind of like lefty philosophy guys. Yeah. Um, that's a total grift. They started all these online seminars, bunch of weirdos. Really? Not, not a real thing. Mm. Oh, yeah. Total scam. Oh, wow. Um, so I've, I've seen that around. Um, yeah. I just assumed it was legitimate because I just never took the time to to prove myself wrong. No. And then, of course, on a larger level, you know, we have like the University of Phoenix and all of these Kaplan for University. profit. Yeah. You know, like the there's lots of ways that people try to grift money out of the university. Um, and, you know, like I'll try to be just so we're not all just shitting on it. I mean... I don't know. So some of like, if someone's going to say the contemporary university system is broken, I'm like, okay, like, I'm not saying you're wrong right there. Tuition is exorbitant. Um, Mm -hmm. Students struggle more than ever to balance work and life with course loads. There's more pressure than ever for degrees to lead to professionalization. 70% of courses are taught by adjunct professors who often make $3,000 per course, some of whom have to live in their cars. Oh yeah, there, there's a lot of problems with the university, um, and I, I, you know, I, I, and I think there's. We talked about this a little bit last time. You know, administrators, kind of like in Hollywood, the administrators who are the executives of academia make all the money, um, when, cool. you know, the professors who are the talent make increasingly less and less. Like there's real stuff going on there. But I think, I mean, something that I think is interesting, right, is a lot of the framing for this is that their courses and their seminars are going to be out debate. Lively debate is a phrase they use over and over. And I mm-hmm. think when you first look at that, like, okay, that's not bad. We we debate sometimes on this podcast and have different views. My take on this, and this is my like putting on my my former college educator hat, is that I don't think the primary purpose of college classes, especially early on, is for lively debate. Because you first have to learn and acquire a certain set of knowledge so that you can actively participate in a debate. And I've seen this before where like, I've taught classes, you know, on ethics or intro to philosophy, and you do have students who like day one are ready to fight it out. And Mm. it's like, okay, that's cool, but we are not in the opinion business. We are in the knowledge and wisdom business. They're different things. I want you to have your opinion, but I want you to be able to say to me, like, you know, David Hume or Simone de Beauvoir or whoever says this thing, here's why I think that is wrong. Not just here's what I think or feel, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And I think... The language they're setting it up is that the ideal model for the university is a little circle of people who are just yelling and like all opinions matter the same. And I I don't think that's what higher education is or what it should Mm be. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like when you guys think about your best experiences in higher education, I mean, were they like yelling at people? No, my best experience. So I went to a, a small private liberal arts college and it like the best class I took was uh, I think there were only like eight, eight students and we awesome. would have discussions like we would mm. the professor would throw a topic and then we would just all talk about it and sit around and, and chat about it. And that I learned the most from those things when there was just civil discussion. And even if we disagreed with each other, um, it it was still very interesting. I the class was on African American literature, and um, like the professor would ask very interesting questions, like, "Do you think, like, do you feel any sympathy for the for the slave owner?" So it like prompted a lot of like uh, self examination to see like what are our biases, what do we think about, um, and I never walked away thinking like, "Oh, so that guy." like in a past life was a total plantation owner. I always like walked away thinking I could understand their perspective. I disagree with it, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to at least hear something that was different than what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I just think with all this too, it's sort of like, I think there's this weird misunderstanding that what free speech or intellectual freedom means is that you can't be wrong. Or right. that no one can say that you do have an opinion that is 
that is that is wrong or antiquated. And I think a lot of the history of whether it's literature or biology is moving forward, recognizing that things we used to believe are true are not true anymore. And that intellectual inquiry isn't about saying, here's the canon, it's done, but let's push it forward. And I know that one of the people, the the professor who I guess is like the president of the school that wrote the op-ed and Barry Weiss's Substack, um, is from a college where until recently, I think, you did not read a person of color until your third year. It was a great books college. So what they do is they go sequentially through history, starting with religious texts, through Greek texts, blah, blah, blah. And not to say that those texts aren't brilliant, but like there's ways you could read Plato and then read feminist responses or black responses to Plato to have a, a kind of more multi-perspective view on that thing. Um, and, and, I, and I guess, too, I just think like this whole notion that people don't have academic freedom is also silly. It's like some ideas aren't good. And sometimes right. those ideas aren't good. You don't get to have them. But the notion that people are being oppressed in universities, like one of the people who's on the board um, is um, an anti-trans academic, Kathleen Stock. Look her up. Not trying to be silly. She just is. She voluntarily resigned from her position because she said students protesting her views curtailed her own academic freedom. Um, and I don't know. And it's just this whole notion, too, that people with more conservative views are being pushed to the margins is kind of silly because if you look historically to touch back on Serby's talk, topic of like Hollywood, it's like, you know, look up the trials in Hollywood in the 40s and 50s where a lot of like left wing Jewish writers had their lives ruined um, because they were deemed to be communist or sympathizers and lost their livelihoods. Um, there's a decent movie with Brian Cranston about that called Trumbo. Um, but yeah, I just think a lot of this sounds silly and I'm just I don't know. They, they say as well that, you know, even though right now this a lot of our people are conservative, we're going to have all views. But like, are you? I don't know. Sure Just, won't. There is a <clears throat> there was a quote in the Substack that like it just made me laugh of like. There were two. One was like nearly a quarter of American academics in the social sciences or humanities endorse ousting a colleague for having a wrong opinion about hot button issues such as immigration or gender differences. And so it's like then going into this conversation about like, you know, we need to have a discourse and have a debate. And it's like, like you said, Michael, it's like, well, you're a racist and a white. Like, no, that's not like that's <clears throat> not a, that's not an opinion. That's like I want to debate with like that doesn't yeah that you doesn't hold a weight space to spew your vibe. you're just a white opinion. supremacist and you want other people to agree with you like that's not like arguing a point or right? that's not like yeah. having an intellectual discourse um it's just yeah this whole thing's wild and yeah i mean in it they're like uh, our whole board, it's like everyone working here, we all have, diff we we have, we differ on political views. And then in looking up all the people on the board, they sure don't. Or if they do, it's like minor. <laughs> very minor. And so this just, yeah, I mean, to to quote uh, Suri's in incredible kind of like, uh, just really straight to the point, um, it's dumb. Yeah. It's fucking dumb. It's, it's fucking pretty, dumb. Pretty dumb, yeah. And like, you know, you said, Riley, there's people involved with this who who espouse views that are akin to phrenology, which is the science of measuring the skulls of people to know their intelligence. This was used to uh, say that that white skull shapes uh, equated to more intellect. There's people involved in this who have um, supported research that says that, you know, people of color have uh, lower IQs as, as a general thing. And they will say it's not they're not being racist. It's just the science. Um, last thing I'll just say as well is I think it's funny that in one of the articles on this, the, the New Republic uh, professor from Colby College wrote a thing about this and just pointed out that the most popular degrees in universities are business, health professions, um, social science and history, engineering and biomedical sciences. Most of the people getting degrees right now are not getting degrees in like gender studies or, you know, the things that people are talking about. Most people are just like trying to get a job in business or working at a hospital. Um but check it out, everyone. It's a great new academic opportunity. We got to get towards our end here. So just a reminder, if you have thoughts on this, if you work at UATX and want to debate <laughs> us um, or invite us to teach a course, uh, you can yeah. do that by emailing us at culturebinge at wisecrack.co. That is culturebinge at wisecrack.co. Or you can call us. No one ever calls anymore. If anyone wants to, you can. No one's left a voicemail in a very long time. I get it. I've never called a podcast. It seems a little <laughs> weird. But we do have a phone number as well, 213-534-8807. That is 213-534-8807. Um, 
A couple of things real quick. We had Anders wrote in and said he loves slaps and chaps. Um, brought up starting with a, a suggestion he made was a slap and chap sandwich. He said this is where you would start with a slap, then do a chap and end with a slap. So as he said it, quote, you get all the cathartic benefit of putting the chap out there into the universe, but still start and end on a positive note. I like Anders thought there. It's kind of fun. The shit um, sandwich. Yes. <laughs> he also said what cheese some of us are. Um, we got <sighs> Michael is a nice sharp cheddar. It has to be there. No matter how fancy or minimal the platter is going to be, it doesn't count without the cheddar. Um, it can go with everything. And if you are ever not sure about how adventurous you want it to be, it'll be a, leave a satisfying taste that leaves you content. Serby is brie cheese. It can be confu- consumed in a couple of different ways, hot or cold, with something sweet or salty. Maybe you eat the rind or maybe you just go for the middle, but it tastes great and you automatically feel sophisticated by its presence. Um, That's lovely. Both of those are such high compliments. I know. Honestly, yeah. it's downhill here. Like, I actually. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, D sent in an article about life in academia uh, where he said, you know, higher education is one of the most um, casualized sectors in the UK economy. And for many, it means a struggle to get by. Kind of relating to what we talked about today. Yeah. Just brought up that like... Um, that it's hard to have a life in academia, that it's hard to work in that sector. And then if maybe we're worried about the university, we should worry about the people that currently work in it and making their lives better. Um, <laughs> he sent this in before the topic today. But um, and he quotes, he referenced a Guardian article that came out a few days ago, the title of which was, my students never knew the lecturer who lived in a tent. So someone who was a lecturer at a university in London couldn't afford to live in London, so lived in a tent. And to be clear, my tone there isn't making fun of that person. It's, I can't believe there's a situation where that happens. Um, also, I, you don't have time to get into all of them. Um, Aiden wrote us an email about supply chain issues and the relationship between that and the labor shortage. Um, although my thing with the labor shortage is always like, we have people, just pay them enough money to do jobs. Um, and then, of course, Ray wrote in some Spain recommendations for Serbi. If anyone else is traveling to Spain soon, let us know. We can share these lovely recommendations. They made me upset because I wish I was going to Spain. Um, Ugh, Riley, are you, are you going to Spain? Going to Spain? You're not? I would love to be going. Well, I would have loved an invite. Would have loved an invite. I so. But I wasn't invited. Wow. To wow, Spain. Wow, Serby. I'm it's, going to Spain so that I can hook up with a very hot Spaniard. Whoa! Oh, girl, then go do it. Go she do got it. That's so real. Serby just ah. announced it. She just said, I'm going on a bang trip. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, my God. A bang trip to Spain? Spain? That's right. amazing. Everyone, That's this is the awesome. stuff you should aspire to. <laughs> Find a hot person in another country that you that you like and respect you, and it's a consensual scenario, and it's someone you enjoy being around, and go there and bang them. Nothing and you do will ever food. be as cool as that. Eat paella. <laughs> and, drink and, and I mean Rioja. you as in like the general you, not you, sir. Have that sex. is the coolest thing you can right? do. <laughs> wow. If all these people starting silly universities were just traveling to Europe, eating some great food, and making love. They yeah. wouldn't need to go to Austin, Texas to hang out with Elon Musk and Joe Rogan. No. You can well, on that same. note, there's nothing I've better the to say. Nothing better to say. God, Godspeed, Serby. Um, Riley, thank you so much for joining us today. You are in that elite group of people who have been <laughs> on all the podcasts. Um, check out Riley on Review Review. Um, you can follow her on social media. Um, go check her out on the new Wisecrack Show Hot Take. And in social media-wise, uh, Riley, where are you at on, on Twitter? On Twitter, I'm at Riley Coyote. And on uh, Instagram, I'm at Riley Anspa. And thank you guys so much for having me. This yeah. was a blast. Awesome. Serby, remind amazing. people where they can find you on the internet. Twitter, Serby Patel 22. Or in Spain. I'm uh, Michael <laughs> O. Burns on Twitter. Michael O. Burns with underscores around the O on Instagram. We'll be back in a couple weeks. Thanks for hanging out with us. This has been Culture Binge. Bye. Bye.